Good afternoon and welcome to the Burton Blatt Institute webinar, Did Civil War Veterans Have PTSD? With some lessons for today's veterans. Our presenters today are Dr. Larry Lowe. Larry is a BBI Senior Fellow. We also have Dr. Peter Blank, University Professor and BBI Chairman. Dr. Lowe comes to BBI from Mississippi College where he was professor of history and political science. He received a doctorate in American civilization from the University of Pennsylvania. Since winning the Francis and Emily Chipman Best First Book Award for A Sermon in the Desert, Belief and Behavior in Early St. George, Utah, Dr. Logue has turned his interest to the experiences of soldiers and veterans of the Civil War. He is the author of To Apotmox and Beyond, and Civil War Soldier in War and Peace, and co-editor with Michael Barton of The Civil War Soldier, a historical reader, and The Civil War Veteran, a historical reader. Both of these are by the New York University Press. For the past decade, Dr. Logue and Dr. Blank have conducted research on Union Army veterans' experience with disabilities and with the federal government's benefits building on articles investigating veterans' longevity and African Americans' treatment in the pension system. They co-authored Race, Ethnicity, and Disability, Veterans and Benefits in Post-Civil War America, a volume in Cambridge University Press, Press's Disability Law and Policy Series. At BBI, Dr. Logue collaborates with Dr. Blank to explore psychological traumas suffered by Union Army veterans. This inve investigation will accumulate in Civil War veterans' psychological illness and suicide lessons. Lessons from the past. This is a new monogram in Cambridge Disability Law and Policy series. Dr. Peter Blank is the university professor at Syracuse University which is the highest faculty rank, rank granted to eight prior individuals in the history of the university. He is also chairman of the Burton Blatt Institute at Syracuse University. Dr. Blank holds appointments at the Syracuse University Colleges of Law and Arts and Sciences, um, Falk College of Sports and Human Dynamics, the School of Education, and the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs. Prior to his appointment at Syracuse, Dr. Blank was Professor of Law and Director of Law, Health, and Policy at the Disability Center at the University of Iowa. Dr. Blank is also Honorary Professor at the Center for Disability Law and Policy at the National University of Ireland, Galway. Dr. Blank received a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Rochester, a JD from Stanford University, where he was President of the Stanford Law Review, and a PhD in social psychology from Harvard University. Dr. Blank has written articles and books on the Americans with Disabilities Act and related laws and received grants to study disability law and policy. Dr. Blank and Robin Malloy are editors of the Cambridge University Press series, Disability Law and Policy. Dr. Blank is also chairman of the Global Universal Design Commission, also known as the GUDC, and the president of Raising the Floor. He is a former member of the President's Committee on Employment of People with Disabilities, a former trustee of the National Institute for People with Disabilities Network, a former senior fellow of Anberg Washington Program, and a former fellow at Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School. Prior to teaching, Dr. Blank practiced law at the Washington, D.C. firm Covington and Burling and served as a law clerk to the late Honorable Carl McGowan of the United States Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. So we have some quite impressive speakers here today. Um, at this point, I'm going to turn today's session over to Dr. Logue. Dr. Logue, good to have you here. Thanks. Thanks for having me, and hello, everybody, on this anniversary of the passage of the ADA. Um, PTSD seems to be everywhere these days, doesn't it? It's, of course, it's most associated with veterans of recent wars, but it seems to be appearing in people with no contact with any war. It's been noticed in victims of campus shootings. It's been 
applied to people with affected by climate change, 36% have PTSD. It's been found in prison guards. As you can see here, they're, con they're subject to constant flashbacks, nightmares, terror, insomnia, and PTSD. It's been found, supposedly, in victims of the witchcraft outbreak in Salem in 1692. And here's a military twist. It was found in this senator who admitted that he plagiarized the paper at the National War College and blamed PTSD for it. A recent study estimated that nearly 7% of adults would have PTSD sometime in their lives, regardless of military background, and at least 3% suffer from it at any given time. PTSD is one of those concepts whose abbreviation is probably much better known than the, what it actually stands for. PTSD has also caught the attention of historians, and in doing so, it's been the subject of a sharp debate. On the one hand, we have historians such as Sarah Handy Cousins here, who referred to Daniel Folsom and the hardships of the war, and she suggests that Folsom had a wounded mind and his illness would likely be called PTSD. And also, um, we have Eric Dean, whose highly influential book concluded that problems indicating PS PTSD were frequently severe in magnitude and existed and were do not appear to be isolated. On the other hand, we have historians such as Wayne Shi, who, as you can see here, said that historians haven't engaged the theoretical literature on trauma, and those who overemphasize trauma among Civil War veterans risk applying our ideas on human consciousness to historical actors who don't necessarily share our assumptions. And historians such as Gary Gallagher and, and Catherine Meyer, who claim that the analytical risk of overemphasizing the dark side of the Civil War is that readers who don't know much about the war might infer the typical experiences, especially the traumas of war, were in fact normative ones. The fundamental issue here is whether it's historically legitimate to engage in what some critics call retrospective diagnosis. One historian has warned that psychological and physiological research now beyond the expertise of most historians might very well complicate how scholars judge and assess Civil War traumas. But this kind of warning to overeager historians overlooks claims made by overeager non-historians, especially this one. Warfare is more deadly, debilitating, and invisible because of the number of combatants, the deadliness of weapons, and we can surmise that the greater the destructive reach of a weaponry, the greater the moral stress. Rather than worrying about invading somebody else's turf, historians might be able to justify their project as evaluation of insinuations like this about the past, insinuations that the less deadly the weaponry, the, more, the fewer the invisible wounds would have been. So the evaluation I'm proposing consists of answers to three questions. First, did the psychological after effects of our time occur after the Civil War II? If so, were they only a few anomalies, or were they enough to warrant a diagnostic label? If that's so, should that label be PTSD? Previous scholarship has already begun to answer that first question, but we can round it out. Eric Dean has demonstrated that many veterans in an Indiana insane asylum suffered from symptoms we associate with PTSD, but other evidence shows that these symptoms occurred more broadly. Evidence like the testimony of Joseph Shipley's brother. Joseph Shipley was an African-American veteran, and as you can see from what Edward was saying, he returned home with affectation of mind. Affection of mind. 
He would walk up and down the street, shooting with a stick, running and shouting, imagining that he was in the army, and shouting, Grant says, blow him up. Elisha Ellis, another veteran, was, according to his wife, sound, healthy man when he, when he enlisted. But when he returned, he was shattered in body and mind, and it got worse. He cursed at her, according to her, and did all his, in his power to make her miserable, and battered her to such an extent, did uh, abuse her to such an extent, that her health is poor and her, con her constitution was shattered. Other veterans I don't have slides on were just as compelling. A report on Archibald Hudson, who was a survivor of the Andersonville prison, concluded that Hudson cannot control his mind or his anger, and at times he desires to commit suicide. Albrecht Moore, another veteran, displayed the distorted reactions that we associate with PTSD, having experienced, in his words, shock and terror during enemy shelling near Petersburg, Virginia. Moore was irritable on hearing noise and suffered from sleeplessness. So the disorders that suggest PTSD can be found in Civil War veterans, both in and out of institutions. Reasoning from anecdotes to an actual disorder, however, is a lot more challenging. For one thing, it's not clear what proportion of 20, 21st century veterans do suffer from PTSD. Estimates vary from 2% to more than 30%. And it's even less clear how, how common psychological disorders were among Civil War veterans. We can, however, make some estimates. An important source for these estimates is a series of five samples compiled over several decades by researchers at the University of Chicago under the direction of Robert Fogel. This is the Early Indicators Project that compiled military, pension, and census records for more than 70,000 Union Army veterans, and is highly useful. I'll refer to this, this, these samples as the EI samples as a reference to the Early Indicators Project. About 30% of the war survivors in these samples filed for a federal pension before 1880. That's about the same amount of time as has elapsed in our time since the beginning of 21st century wars. Slightly over 1% of the applicants who filed were diagnosed with a mental illness, that is, insanity, mania, melancholia, and the like, as they were called in those days, in the mandatory medical exam that they were given. This figure appears pretty negligible compared to the current estimates for PTSD, especially since the Civil War rate includes all mental illnesses rather than those just caused by traumatic experiences. However, current estimates come from self-reported answers to checklists in the 21st century that call attention to possible symptoms, while the Civil War rate comes from physicians whose attention was focused on the physical disabilities that were the main qualification for a pension. So, incidents of mental illness after the Civil War can't be directly compared to PTSD prevalence now. But we can make other comparisons. If we can't compare across centuries, what we can do is use post-Civil War civilians as a benchmark. If we find a difference in mental illness between veterans and others in the same era, we can gauge the significance of the war's psychological traumas. Table one here shows the comparison. The year is 1880, when the US Census Bureau made its most serious effort to assess mental illness in America. The Bureau printed special schedules for information about insane individuals and conducted a separate survey of physicians to identify those otherwise missed. Barons in the table are from the EI sample of men who enlisted in the five largest cities. That's the one where the coders were the most diligent. The comparison population is from a 10% sample of the 1880 census using all white men 30 to 60. That would, of course, include veterans, We'll talk about African Americans later. After adjusting for age distributions, veterans were only modestly more likely to be recorded as insane, but two factors would probably increase the margin even more. If we could remove veterans from the general sample, the civilian insanity rate would probably go lower. Second, there were enough veterans who were judged insane in pension examinations, but not listed that way in the US Census 
to raise the insanity rate to what you see here in Table 2. When we include the census, the pension exams, the difference becomes considerable. There are also probably non-veterans whose mental illness went unreported in the census, but they hardly face the traumas of men such as Ferdinand and Philman. Having been wounded at Second Bull Run and hospitalized for disease, Feldman came home with attacks of irritable or excitable condition when he is unmanageable. Feldman was twice admitted to an insane asylum, but his condition went unreported in the 1880 census. Those, these comparisons are only suggestive and hint at the breadth of the psychological burden carried by Civil War veterans. If the incidence of insanity suggests delayed trauma's breadth, suicide indicates its depth. Suicide is seen as the worst possible outcome of PTSD, as it was for Randall Stevenson here. And a surge in suicide is taken as a national emergency, as in this article here, where veterans' suicide rate is increasing much faster than the civilian rate constituting a national emergency. Looking to the past, however, if we try to make a comparison there, we've got another measurement issue. The further back in time we go, the more mistakes we suspect we'll find in identifying suspicious deaths as suicides. And that may be broadly true, but there is an exception. Officials in Massachusetts wanted to take the lead in producing accurate vital statistics, and they became the first state in America to mandate uniform reporting in the mid-19th century. In the 1870s, when coroners were suspected of still misreporting deaths, Massachusetts abolished the office of coroner and replaced it with the first state-appointed medical examiners. Though we might not expect the state's reporting to be up to 21st century standards, its 19th century suicide information should be the best we can get. With this information in hand, we find that our expectations about worse emergencies and better present-day information are wrong. Here's a table that shows suicide rates for Massachusetts veterans and civilians in federal and state census years from 1870 to 1900. Veterans were substantially more likely than civilians to die by suicide, and their rate in the depression-ridden mid-1890s approached an extraordinary one per 1,000 veterans. How do these rates compare with today's national emergency? Table 4 shows the best available information we have on veterans and civilians' contemporary rates of suicide compiled by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. In several years, and in the aggregate, the post-Civil War rates were considerably higher than these 21st century ones. So if veteran suicide are now a national emergency, the late 19th century rate saw a worse crisis of post-war trauma. Was there a public alarm over this psychological toll? The short answer is no. Newspapers did routinely cover suicides. They occasionally mentioned that a suicide had been a veteran, and they sometimes reported with a hint of irony when a veteran received a pension for insanity. But they went no farther. Officials at insane asylums, which is the 19th century's term for the institutions, likewise made few comments on veterans' anxiety disorders except to minimize them. The superintendent of the government hospital for the insane was typical. Here's where, what he said. It should not be inferred that the war has been a prolific moral cause of insanity, either among the land and, and naval forces or among civilians. And no more than 2% of the cases received from the Army and Navy has even the exciting cause appeared to be the excite, excitements attending participation in the war. Two decades later, Isaac Stearns, a former Army surgeon, tried to call attention to veterans' continuing psychological problems. The traumas of Army life, he said, 
including severe mental strain, produced susceptibility to unfavorable impressions, sleeplessness, and loss of power to concentrate for thoughts or energies. Stern's proposed, as you can see, a name for this, this veteran's disorder, chronic postbellum neurokinesis. The name fell on deaf ears. Why did this apparent culture of indifference dominate? Contemporaries understood that warfare could devastate the body, leaving ex-soldiers with physical weakness through no fault of their own. Federal and state governments responded with unprecedented compassion to these kinds of disabilities, granting generous pensions and creating soldier homes for the neediest veterans. Mental illness, on the other hand, was considered mostly an elective weakness, especially among men. In any given year, as many as half the men in, admitted to insane asylums were supposedly driven there by intemperance or masturbation. An asylum official in New York State elaborated on the distinction. Two volunteers, as he put it, were strong in the face of battle and the other privation of war, producing what he called a freedom from insanity. They showed what patriots can do and suffer and yet be strong. The lofty patriotism which elevated and sustained those on whom the great losses fell were real patriots, real men, and were free from insanity. So the 19th century calculus of responsibility deflected attention away from the Civil War's psychological consequences. Most of what I've talked about so far applied to both races, but African Americans had traumas of their own. Black soldiers in the army risked being captured and sold into slavery, being massacred by vengeful Confederates, or being murdered while occupying southern states after the war. Yet the usual metrics actually show a lower incidence of psychological disorders among black veterans. This table five is the counterpart to table one, also from the 1880 census, this time using veterans from the colored, US colored troops part of the sample versus all black men 30 to 60. And the black rates for insanity were considerably less for both civilians and veterans than among the white population and especially low for veterans. There are no black veterans suicide from Massachusetts, so we can't make that comparison. But the overall African-American suicide probability from the EI samples was likewise considerably lower than the probability for white, soldiers, white veterans. These rates probably say more about flaws in the usual measures than about the actual incidence of psychological problems among black veterans. Here's why. There was a substantial regional difference in reported insanity among African-American men. The rate in the North was almost twice the rate of insanity for the former Confederate states. That's a first puzzling, given contemporary authorities' pronouncements to the contrary. Northern commentators insisted that black people were less prone to mental illness than whites, while Southerners insisted that emancipation had unleashed an epidemic of insanity among former slaves possible answer to this conundrum comes from applicants' statements in pension examinations. A number of white applicants joined former soldier Frank, Frank Buxton, who admitted that he had become insane as a result of two or three as a result two or three years ago, lasting about one year as a result of a gunshot wound to the head. Other whites said that too. But black applicants, even when they cited psychological problems, never used the label insanity. So it's possible that as significant as the stigma of mental illness was for 19th century white men, it was almost certainly worse for African Americans, especially in the South, which would help to account for our unusual findings. The suicide difference between the races is more challenging to figure out. Historians have suggested that suicide was relatively common among slaves, which would accord with avoidance after emancipation. 
other scholars studying the late 19th century suggest an African-American suicide avoidance that was rooted in honor-based culture. It's been further suggested that veterans' comradeship deterred suicide, but a tentative comparison suggests otherwise. Suicides of black veterans in the EI samples occurred at a rate of 10 per 100,000 in the early 1890s, compared to only six per 100,000 among all black men in the 1890 U.S. Census. So we can see glimpses of black veteran psychological burden in evidence like Joseph Shipley's flashbacks and other evidence, but its magnitude remains shrouded behind fragmentary evidence. <coughs> so now it's time to tackle my third question. Should we conclude that what we found is PTSD? The road to an answer lies between two signposts. One, the historical specificity of the PTSD concept versus, on the other hand, the idea of the universal soldier, which is the belief that all soldiers belong to a brotherhood and sisterhood of warriors. Coining PTSD was supposed to break with the past, to undo the long-standing calculus of culpability. PTSD's original advocates wanted recognition that Vietnam veterans psychological disorders originated externally, not from some moral deficiency. This objective underlies the warning against applying modern concepts to the past. Uh, and uh, uh, but historians are a restless lot, and they're inclined to be skeptical about warnings. Something doesn't quite sit right about a complete break from the past, especially when it's accompanied by assertions that 21st century warfare is worse than any other. Eric Dean, who I mentioned before, and others have poked holes in these, this assertion by finding traces of PTSD symptoms in Civil War veterans. But we need to probe farther into PTSD's implications to find a fuller answer. In earlier wars, Many veterans who developed a mental illness had obvious wounds or observable diseases that qualified them for benefits. But by the late 20th century, military medicine could prevent or treat most disabilities of physical nature, leaving psychological disorders alone in the glare of official disapproval. This medical development was at least as important as changes in warfare, and devising PTSD was a logical response but a clean break from the past didn't actually happen. Unlike most conditions presented in the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, PTSD was originally tied to specific stresses, combat, natural disasters, torture, and the like. This had the effect of ruling out moral deficiency as a cause, but that logic was hardly new. After the Civil War, for example, Federal policy defined as insanity occurred in the line of you know, duty as pensionable, as you can see here. In this case, that since the insanity did result from injury to the spine, even though it led to suicide, it was an outcome of the injuries received in the line of duty and was a pensionable disability. But at the same time, federal policy disallowed veterans who were, as this veteran was, weak-minded and predisposed to insanity. It might be objected that there's little of correspondence between the physical disabilities that accompanied mental illness in the Civil War era and the traumatic memories of our own time. But the psychiatrist who actually wrote the original definition of PTSD was influenced by her awareness of its symptoms among the burn victims she'd encountered. There's no evidence that PTSD's originators consulted any earlier era for their criteria, but the evidence we do have is compelling. By adopting the logic of cause and effect to validate the contemporary disorder, PTSD's inventors forged a link, whether they meant to or not, with the past. This logic and PTSD's terminology form the basis of the answer that I'm proposing to my third question. Terminology matters. Critics are right to point out that 19th century Americans had no frame of reference for understanding how profound traumas could prey on otherwise healthy minds. 
suffering caused by PTSD symptoms and those like them were as real in the past as they are now, but the context was different. PTSD's most important feature may be the vocabulary it provides for professionals and ordinary people to understand a debilitating condition. Some Civil War veterans experienced the same torment, but in the absence of the vocabulary, it's inappropriate to call it PTSD. But we shouldn't let this discourage us from pursuing an equally important finding. Both the PTSD diagnosis and Civil War pension policy rested on cause and effect. This would be little more than an interesting coincidence were it not for the indicators of magnitude that I've introduced before. The causes differed, wounds and disease then versus traumatic memories now, and contemporary recognition differed, silence then versus headlines now. But the estimates I've shown point to a 19th century mental health crisis that equal or exceeded anything that's happening in our own time. This raises a final question. If not PTSD, what should we call this crisis? The semantics of any label are less significant than the need to remember the signposts I mentioned earlier. Anger, terror, and anguish are instantly recognizable. They bring past and present together. Veterans then and now have experienced these emotions more than civilians do, tempting us to adopt the image of the universal warrior. But if the after effects of war are similar, the causes are a barrier between the 19th century and our own time. Many of the Civil War's diseases, wounds, and injuries are now preventable or treatable, and we would find that time's path from trauma to mental illness to be alien to our experience. We might turn to a maxim proposed by a 20th century novelist to explain why. He said the past is a foreign country, they do things differently there. The world of the Civil War veterans' mental health is one we've escaped, but we can still recognize pieces of it. Perhaps it's time to give Isaac Stearns, the physician we, whose picture we saw before, some of his due. Neurokinesis has lost its meaning as a shock to the nerves, but the rest of the concept is useful. Might we call Civil War veterans' condition chronic postbellum disorder? Maybe. It's general enough to include other ears before the 20th century's breakthrough in military medicine, but it's specific enough to set it off from the advent of PTSD. That's what we found about the past. I'll turn it over now and let you listen to Peter Blank on his commentary on what this means for the present. Thank you, Larry. Fantastic presentation. and. Uh, so much interesting uh, discussion to think about, uh, particularly also given the, the lack of systematic research in this area. I'll, I'll go up, if it's OK, Larry, a few 10,000 feet or so, to answer the question, why BBI, Burton Blatt Institute, and Southeast ADA and Civil War? Well, as Larry mentioned, today is the 27th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is still revolutionary in our world. Uh, it may be getting less attention today, but it still has changed the lives of millions of people, hundreds of millions of people around the world. The Burton Blatt Institute really at its bottom is a focus on the focuses on the human endeavor. It focuses on how people are the same and different in that endeavor in terms of their characteristics, motivations, emotions. And sometimes when those characteristics are different, uh, they're labeled as a disability or an impairment. And what BBI tries to do is to understand the acceptance in society, the civil rights of individuals, and basically the human rights of people who are same, similar, and different in society. Historically, of course, whether it's race, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, difference in society can be greeted with stigma, uh, be, be greeted with uh, contempt, and other forms of outcasting from society. EBI uh, has been a leader in trying to understand from an interdisciplinary perspective, that is today you heard a historical perspective, but also we look at 
psychological, economics, medical, and importantly, participatory action approaches that is involving people with disabilities as our colleagues and partners in the study of these illustrations of these areas as well. And of course, we look at that over the life course. Now, what you heard today was a large, was part of a large body of study which looked at the historical evolution of conceptions in the public and in law and policy about disability. Larry and I began our work years ago and our starting point was after the Civil War because in fact that's when the largest disability type administrative system in the world was first began. Probably larger than the one in Germany at the time under Bismarck's government um, and that was of course the Civil War pension system. It involved hundreds of thousands of individuals with visible and less visible disabilities uh, of different color, gender, ethnicity, race, sexual orientation potentially. Of course, not a, not a lot of those characteristics were thought of as we presently think of them today. I say gender also because in a whole separate area, the widows and the dependents of these Civil War veterans also received for the first time uh, payments as a result of their uh, spouses, wounds, and, and death in the war. Now the area of non-visible mental disabilities is also a primary, has been an, and is also a primary focus of the Burton Blatt Institute because historically and today it has been subject to such stigmatization in society. And that's particularly associated with mental disability, mental illness, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, traumatic distress, and, and stress syndromes as we're talking about here. And we find, interestingly, historically, as we do today, that the less visible, uh, the more stigmatized the condition was by raised by Civil War veterans, even uh, you know at the time of the Civil War for their pensions, uh, resulted in very similar stigmatization uh, then as it did today with regard to, for example, lower payment of pensions, even when you control for the severity of the disability. Now, of course, today, as Larry pointed out, uh, we have tens of thousands of veterans who are returning from the wars in the Middle East. And in our lifetime now, there certainly has been much research and discussion about this so-called national epidemic of suicide uh, facing veterans with disabilities, veterans with mental health conditions. And uh, we're, of course, not in a position to dispute the uh, validity of that epidemic or not. There are many, many people who have been funded large sums of money in the Veteran Administration and elsewhere to study the causes and the outcomes related to mental health conditions and suicide and so forth. But what's striking to me and, and Larry, of course, is the fact that, number one, we still are grappling today uh, in that there really is not a consensual understanding of the causes of suicide, of who is based on a certain types of characteristics will be more or less likely to commit suicide. As a matter of fact, Larry may want to comment on this, my understanding is almost the opposite that um, it's just as hard to predict uh, suicide uh, as, as whether or not the person has some history of mental health problems or not in many cases. And there have been some seminal studies of that. What we tried to do in the Civil War study, um, and for me it was a, a pairing made in heaven to be paired with a first class leading historian uh, with somebody who's particularly interested in civil rights and conceptions of human rights today is to try to understand not only the prevalence, as Larry has talked about, uh, and the nature of suicide and, and perhaps how people perceived that and wrote about that at the time, uh, but also the extent to which those same sort of discussion and description is apparent today. And, and what does that tell us about how we perceive of disability, mental health conditions, 
uh, stress-related disorders, and so forth, and, and all of which is a very complicated question. So I would just conclude, Larry, because we do want to take some questions, uh, by suggesting that this, this particular study, to me, is illustrative of the larger type of analysis that's needed to unpack both historical and present analyses um, about the nature of disability yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Uh, Larry, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not aware of an empirical study of Civil War veteran suicide of the kind that you presented today, which shows uh, in, in some detail the magnitude of the suicide uh, issues, the suicide problem at that time. Of course, there have been many uh, uh, articles and books written about the narratives, reading the pension records and so forth. But I think uh, one of the major advances of this particular study is to begin the historical empirical analysis of conceptions of disability and the impact that certain life experiences, in this case, the war's experience, had on the, on the post-war lives of these individuals, which dramatically shaped a whole generation of Americans, an extraordinarily large cohort of Americans, uh, well into the 19th century. So Larry, I hope that puts a little uh, larger spin on why we're approaching this and how we're approaching this. I give you a chance, Larry, I see we only have a, a 15 minutes left, to perhaps make some closing comments and or comment on some of the things that I've said, and then we can open up for questions. Yeah, to, to follow up on, on one of the things you said, um, ours is really the first empirical study. And why that's important is that a, a, a fair number of historians have, as, we, as I sample in our presentation, have given some compelling examples of the, the individual cost and individual narrative of mental illness. But we have to keep in mind that, that mental illness and its, its problems are as much epidemiological as they are a matter of medical diagnosis. And so that's what we've tried to do here is to, is to add the, the, the larger picture of how common these problems are. It really makes a difference. And that's why people are struggling so much with the prevalence of PTSD. How much of a problem is it? And as you can see from what I said before, we really don't know, but it's important to find out just how much of a problem it is, and just as important to find out how much of a problem mental illness and suicide in particular were in the post-Civil War era. It, it makes a difference. And so to emphasize what, what Peter said, there are, there are lessons that we have for the, the present, one of which is that we shouldn't, in our, in our emphasis on PTSD, which is a real problem with a real, a real magnitude, we shouldn't forget mental illness that's caused by injuries and disease. That's, that was the overwhelming root of civil post-Civil War mental illness. And we should remember that veterans now still, even if they don't grab the headlines or make uh, interesting TV shows, there are still veterans who are suffering considerable anguish and psychological torment from physical causes as well as the others. So I think this, this study is a step forward and will probably raise as many questions as it answers, but that's the whole purpose. So if, uh, as, if Peter has no more um, to add, then we can deal with some questions and comments if you folks are all ready. Great. Celestia, do you want to take comments? Or Sure. Um, if anybody has any questions or comments, please type them in the chat area and we will um, address them with our speakers. Thank you. Larry, if we don't hear any questions, 
would you like to talk about um, perhaps, I, I know we haven't talked too much about it, but where do you and I, or where do you, if you, unless you continue to collaborate with me, what's next from this? Um, has this sparked anything new in you that you hadn't thought about before that interests you with regard, of course, to the study of the Civil War or history in general? There is an awful lot yet to be done on Civil War veterans, including from those EI samples, which I'm, I pointed to earlier. They, they're a wealth of information, and I think that there are related questions, such as the issue of attempted suicides. It would be very interesting to look at in terms of, of um, mental illness and after effects of war, what happens to veterans who attempt suicide but don't complete it. There's the studies that are done nowadays tend to suggest there's considerable differences in among people who complete and attempt suicide. That would be interesting. And there's there's conditions that we kind of shied away from, like epilepsy and sunstroke, that are epilepsy was was a kind of catch-all that was that was poorly understood at that point. Sunstroke was a sort of uh, physical uh, ailment that also could be used to explore further. And some of the things I'm interested in as well are Civil War veterans. What happened to Civil War veterans who were blind, for example? I haven't seen much on that. There's been an awful lot on amputees. There's a, a minor boom in studies of amputees, but not that much of Civil War veterans who were blind. So the, the field of history of disability is really rich and really exciting these days. And I think the possibilities for exploring the experiences of Civil War veterans along those same lines are remarkable. So um, I, see, I see this as a starting point. And those are some directions I think I'd be interested in, in pursuing as well. Larry, this is why I love working with you, because I had a, uh, I think what you said is fantastic, but I, had, I was going to answer my own question with a totally different uh, area that maybe we will study. And that is, um, I'm particularly interested as a result of this, if, we could, if there are data, in studying veterans with disabilities and mental illness, say, whether it's the Civil War and contemporaneously, although, of course, contemporaneously is a totally different uh, bag that we'd have to undertake, but the, but the impact of that on the family unit of the returning soldier, and, uh, of course, if the soldier does commit su suicide uh, through census records or others, uh, the impact of that on the next generation of children in that family to look at the intergenerational effects uh, of these sorts of issues. And I, I do believe also, a, it's not completely original what I'm saying, because I think that the EI sample is moving in that direction uh, with regard to looking at the cross-generational influences of stigma as affecting a core family member. Um, the reason why I'm interested in that, by the way, is because I think there are, again, strong contemporary applications uh, in that area, and um, uh, a lot of which has not yet been studied. Certainly, I'm not aware of it historically. Are, are you, Larry? Not historically. I've, and in some of my work on my digging on PTSD, I have found articles that explore the issue, or at least ask the question whether PTSD is inheritable. and. Um, as far as I know, nothing's been done on that in for historical population. Well, that's our next book, then, Larry. Right? Put that on the yeah. put that on the list. That's on the list. <laughs> yes. On the to-do uh, list. Are there data available to look at the the children of these Civil War veterans in the EI sample or their spouses? There would be, um, especially if they. Often, often children and spouses applied for their own pensions. They were eligible for them. And so there would be some multi-generational information. I think so. it was the case, Larry, wasn't it? If the, the, the widow spouse of a Civil War veteran remarried, 
did she not lose those pension benefits for the former husband? She did. She did. And so, so there was there was a lot of, in, of inquiry into marriage licenses and remarriages and divorces and all those sorts of things. So there's an economic for for those people like my wife who are and me who are married out there. There's clearly an economic disincentive for the wives to get remarried. Yes. <laughs> At least formally. Yeah, exactly. So, Celestia, should we take any final questions? I believe uh, it's been, at least for me, a very interesting session. Uh, clearly, it's an area which is uh, leading edge in terms of the empirical research, as Larry has talked about. And certainly, we hope it has stimulated some thinking about not only the conception of disability historically, uh, but of course how we're grappling with that today in a time in which um, there is an administration, President Trump's administration, which I think it is fair to say um, as of yet has not clearly outlined its approach to a disability agenda uh, with regard to going forward in this area. Uh, under President Obama, for example, uh, I believe the, uh, or no, under President, the, the second President Bush, the ADA Amendments Act was passed in 2008. Of course, under President Obama, there were issues related to health care for people with disabilities, and the reaction to that is all playing out as we speak in the United States Senate today, all of which have terrific implications for uh, health care services and the lives of people with serious and persistent mental health issues, and of course, veterans as well. So, Celestia, if there are no comments or questions, um, I was always taught as a lawyer, if hearing nothing else, it's better to be quiet than to prolong the discussion. Exactly. So, um, Dr. Logue and Dr. Blank, thank you for joining us today. And for all of you on the call, this has been archived, and we will post it on the VBI site. I encourage you to share it with all of your colleagues who may be interested in this topic. And thank you once again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.